the passage of scripture that the message this morning is going to be based upon comes from the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians and most of it will be from chapter 4. If you want to follow along in the Pew Bible in front of you, then you'll find that on page 1176, 1176. To indicate the direction in which the message will take this morning, let me begin by making two assertions. One relates directly to our everyday experience, and one relates directly to our eternal well-being. The first assertion is that different individuals have different attitudes towards the clothes that they wear. For some of them, those that are highly fashion conscious, it's very important. For some who think that their clothes should reflect their character and their conduct, it's also important. And of course, for some of them, the task at hand means that it's very important. The surgeon needs to put on surgical gloves if he's going to perform an open-heart operation. But there are others who are supremely unconcerned about the clothes that they wear. I suspect that this first assertion is evident to all of you. We have the evidence in front of us. The second assertion, the one that concerns our eternal well-being, is that a, a Christian's spiritual clothing is of vital, of supreme, of surpassing importance. Now, the Bible is full of reference to clothes, right from the beginning through to uh, the end. Uh, you might reco- recall the, the problems that Joseph had because he had a multicolored coat, or that John the Baptist wore clothes as he lived in the desert out of camel's hair, or the prodigal son having the father's coat placed upon him, or even Jesus on the cross had a very special garment that had no, um, uh, well, it was just a one piece. Now, those, although they are symbolic, refer to actual clothes. But when I talk about spiritual clothes, I really am using spiritual clothes as a metaphor. The metaphor, just to illustrate for you, suppose you have a friend who is very dependable, is always there for you, always supports you, and you might refer to this friend as your rock. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the piece of granite on your coffee table, but it means that somebody who is close to you, whose conduct and character and and relationship to you is of vital importance to you and a vital help. And so when we talk about clothing, a spiritual clothing, we're talking about a person's character and conduct. But we're also talking about something that's important, just as when Jesus said, I am the door, he did not mean that he was a piece of oak, What he meant was something far more significant, that it was through Jesus Christ that one come come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we depend upon all that we have as Christians. And so the metaphor, character, conduct, and something very important. And then, of course, because it's spiritual clothing, it means that it's something that is conveyed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's this second assertion that our spiritual clothes are things that are of vital, surpassing importance to us that I want to focus on this morning. And to have such a theme put in front of us means, well, it invites lots of questions. Are there spiritual clothing? You will presume already that I think there is. But then who is to wear this spiritual clothing? Who are the individuals who are involved? And what are they? And then what's the motivation for putting on spiritual clothing? Or finally, how do we acquire those clothes? And then to what effect? So these are very simple yet profound questions. And it's these that I want to consider with you this morning. And I want to do that in the context of the reading that I mentioned earlier on from Ephesians. Why Ephesians? You might ask, well, from one standpoint, 
the whole letter can be viewed as an invitation for us to put on spiritual clothes, giving both the reason for it and the effect that it has. So let me turn with you then to Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll begin to read at verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together to every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say to you and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard of him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. So to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then there follows in the remainder of chapter 4 some of the implications of putting on spiritual clothes. And then if I can read to you just the first two verses of chapter 5 as well, because Paul continues, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Let me say something about the background to this passage and the background indeed to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul's writing from Rome and the circumstances were very unusual for him. He had been very active indeed. Hect he had led a hectic life. On his mission, his Christ-given mission to spread the gospel. He had traveled through what would now be Israel and Lebanon and Syria and Turkey and Macedonia and Greece, not to mention Cyprus, Sicily, Malta. Uh, and eventually Italy, and now to where he was in Rome. And during that time, he had been persecuted, he'd been challenged, he'd been chastised, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been physically attacked, and he'd been interrogated. But now he was under house arrest in Rome, with the possibility of execution facing him. And it's said that nothing focuses the mind more the knowing that you're going to be hanged tomorrow morning. Now, Paul was going to be hanged several days. Well, Paul had several days upon which to think upon this. And so he was reflecting upon this hectic life that he'd had, reflecting upon how Christ had come into his life, reflecting upon what Christ meant to him. And it's in that context that he writes this letter to the people, to the Christians in the neighborhood of Ephesus. It was a time that he had. He hadn't asked for it, but it was a time that was given to him. And what we find is that in chapters 1 to 3 of this letter, he sets out really with passion and conviction what he understands of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pure doctrine, if you like. What he knew what he had come to know by personal experience of Christ, what that meant. That was basically, that's basically what doctrine is. What we learn of Christ through knowing him. And he does that in chapters 1 to 3 with passionate reasoning. And then in chapters 4, 5 and 6, he applies that doctrine. So doctrine apart from application would be devoid of value. But 
Paul is sure that he wants to point out to these Christians what it means, what the doctrine implies for their lives. And so in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he sets out now passionately, but again reasonably, what that means. And I would challenge you, if you want to read chapters 4, 5, and 6, don't read them until you've read chapters 1, 2, and 3, because they will not make any sense to you. They will challenge you, and you will not be able to get to grips with them. But if you read chapters 1, 2, and 3 first, then you'll understand why Paul is saying what he says in chapters 4, 5, and 6. There's a, an old song, and a part of the song goes, you can't have one without the other. You can't have your Christian belief, your faith, your teaching, unless you also have a Christian life, a sanctified life for Christ. This is the hallmark of the Christian. And this is what Paul wants to emphasize throughout the gospel. And this is what he comes to focus on in the passage that we are uh, looking at today. So, our first question are they are their spiritual clothes? Well, let me remind you of what I read earlier, verses 22 and 24. 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Verse 24, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So it's fairly clear to us from those simple two verses that yes there are spiritual clothes and that being a Christian means a change of clothing. The Christians in Ephesus at that time and us today Christians today are to put off their old self and to put on the new self. And Paul with a brazen acerbic vitriolic description tells us what the old self is like and he pulls no punches he says that the old self was someone who was futile in mind darkened in his understanding accompanied by an alienation from God because their hearts were hardened because they were impure and corrupt and their so was their conduct and practices and you say wow that's not the way you speak today This is condemnatory. Everyone has the right to do what they want, how they want. Everyone is equal. That's the dogma, the mantra that we hear hear today. And confronted with such vitriolic statements, perhaps we should pause and think. Recall that Paul loved the people that he was writing to. He called them beloved. He called them his his own self. Not only that, when Paul says that that's the way they were like, he also says that he is the worst of sinners. If you look at 1 Timothy, I think it's 1 Timothy 3.15, you'll find that he regards himself as the worst of sinners. So this isn't somebody looking and put it, pointing a finger at somebody else and saying, you're bad. This is somebody who's pointing the finger at somebody else and saying, terrible, but I'm worse. So it cannot be a case of equality. Christianity is not equality, but Christianity is Christ. And then there's this idea that we're free to do what we like. And Paul would agree. The Christian gospel is one that tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, There, the individual, you and I are free. True freedom is living alongside Christ. True freedom is being set apart from, removed from, the crutches and the condemnation and and the captivity that we were in. And Paul then, having said what their lives were and what they were to put off, and these were Christians, so he's saying, continually put off these things. It's not a question of it happening someday in the past. He's saying every morning, put it off. And then he goes on and warmly and affectionately in verses 24, uh, in chapter 4, verses 24 and 5, and again in chapter 5, verse 2, 
he declares that this change of clothing involves the Christian changing into a new attire. What is this new attire? It's the likeness of God's righteousness and holiness and Christ's love and sacrifice. So the input of these verses are striking. They're challenging. Are there spiritual clothes? Most certainly, yes. What are they? Clothed in God's righteousness and holiness. It's not some highfalutin intellectual idea, philosophical idea about knowledge, but it's knowing a person and becoming like that person. It's not a standard, an ethical code or a moral code that we abide by. It's knowing Christ and being like him. And then we come to the question, who's involved in this? Who's to participate in this change of clothing? Is it for all Christians or for some Christians? Is it an optional extra? No hint of that. It's not something that we might consider at some stage. Paul says, put off. Not an option. It's not something that's involuntary, something that happens to us. We are to put off. We are to put on. We are to be actively involved in this process. And it's not designed, no hint of it here, for some subset of the Christian community, some deeply spiritual Christian, or somebody who desperately needs to put on new clothes. It's everybody. It's you and it's me and every other Christian. So these are strident claims. Is this only Paul saying this here? Well, listen to Paul writing to the Colossians and saying much the same thing. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. But now you must put them all away. You have put off the old self with its practices. And then he goes on, and this is now Paul writing to the Colossians, and now you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. Put on then as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved, and he goes on. So we could come now and say, well, if we're going to put on some new clothes, there must be a reason for putting it on. There must be a motivation for putting it on. So what is that? Well, we mentioned it before. We might want to please someone. Clearly, if we're putting on spiritual clothes, we want to please the create, our Creator. We might want, it may be our task. As Christians, we are not alone. We are not bereft of a job. We have jobs as Christians. Mention the surgeon's gloves. He's curing somebody. He's perhaps saving somebody's life. We as Christians too, or our job requires it. You know, if you're moving around high, uh, heavy equipment, you might need shoes that are uh, um, boots that are steel capped. And for us as Christians, from time to time. We need steel-capped shoes because we have to contend for our faith. So what is the motivation then? That's one of the reasons, but you know, it's set out for us between the put off and the put on. Let me read to you again verse 22. Put off your old self, and it goes on. And then verse 24, put on the new self. But sandwiched in between is verse 23. How is this to be achieved? It says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And that's essentially how we are to accomplish this change of clothing. And that's going to be the motivation for changing our clothing. So let's look at that expression for a minute. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. It means your mind is going to be changed. You're going to have a different mind set as a Christian. The Germanic countries came across this concept of worldview perhaps much earlier than most people, Weltanschauung. They said you can look at life from this standpoint or you can look at life from that standpoint, but how you look at life will determine how you behave. And the Christian gospel came across it before the Germanic countries because here Paul is saying you can look at at life as you normally do or you can look at it through Christ's eyes. See things from Christ's standpoint. That's what 
being changed in our mind is. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't say only that. In the spirit of your minds. Now, for those of you who read uh, or like Martin Luther's version of the gospel, this particular verse comes out like this. Erneuert euch aber in eurem Geist und Sinn, mind and spirit. The German standard version today has exactly that same wording. You don't just live, uh, look at life from a human standpoint. You don't just look at the life from an intellectual standpoint. But through your heart and mind and soul come together. And what we mean by that is that it's not a change, a change in clothing that's induced by human understanding and knowledge. Not pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps but allowing this Holy Spirit to enable us to, uh, to change our clothing. It's a change of clothing whereby the Holy Spirit enlightens us, enlightens our hearts and our minds, so that we have a new understanding, a new knowledge of spiritual truth. But it's not just a heart and mind change. It's a renewal, a renewed mind that we look at these things. And so that's not just a, a mere adjustment of our priorities, if you like, or a major reordering of our thoughts. It's something totally new, different. Listen to um, how Paul puts this somewhere else in Romans chapter 12, in fact. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, I was based in the United <coughs> I'm breaking things here. <laughs> Deacons, I apologize. The verse in Romans chapter 12 was, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I was based in the United States at the NASA, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration center, Research Center for a year. And my immediate superior was somebody that I came to like enormously. He was a full-blooded, redneck North Carolinian. He expressed himself without concern for what people thought of him. Said things the way they were. And I remember him vividly telling me once about his attitude to his young, two young boys who were growing up. And he said that if they came to him and told him and came to him and he knew that they had done something that he disapproved of. If they came to him and told him that they had done it because everybody else did it. He said that he would punish them very fiercely. And I can believe that knowing the individual. He would got the first part. Don't be as Christians conform to the world. If the world does this or the world does that. That doesn't mean that you do this. You do that. But he'd missed the second part because Paul goes on and says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And the word for renewal that is used here is used only once in the Gospels. And it refers to the time when Christ went up the mountain of transfiguration, transformation, if you like. And on at that momentous event, we read the following. And he was transfigured, transformed, if you like, he was transformed before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Now this is literal now, but the re renewal of our mind is the same thing. We are to be transformed. We were like that, but now we're not. We're going to be something different and we're going to be something that enables us to be identified with Christ. There's going to be a change in our appearance. There's going to be a change in our clothing. So if renewal in the spirit of our mind means all of this, new mind, heart, soul, and mind, renewed mind, then what is it that we understand that will enable us to change our clothing, that will enable us to comprehend what the new man in Christ is to be like. What is it that will propel us, prompt us, enable us to change our clothing? 
was, as I mentioned earlier, chapters 1 through to 3 give us a, an overview, Paul's delightful overview of what that entails. I'm not going to go there through that in detail with you now, but I'd like to pick up one or two, or three points, basically, of what Paul sets out in general related to our change of clothing, what it is that will force us, propel us, enable us, compel us to change our clothing. First of all, Paul emphasizes in chapter 1, and he emphasizes it in verses 5, 8, and 11, and again later on in chapters 2, that God has a purpose and a plan for you and for me, for people, and for his entire creation. It's a plan and a purpose that he set out, that he formed in the council of the triune God outside of of time, but he's now executing it, is putting it, undertaking it, putting it into operation in time, in our lives. His sovereign purpose that he's sovereignly working out for us now. What is this purpose? Paul describes it time and time again in chapter 1 as a mystery. A mystery not like a magician who comes onto the stage, performs a trick, and you say, hey, how did that? But a mystery that Christ, that God reveals to us in Christ, because he says, in Christ God has made known to us the mystery of his, of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So he has a plan for each one of us, and that plan he has revealed in Christ for us. And that plan, we've celebrated communion. Communion is about the redemption that Christ bought for us. To redeem is to buy back, to regain, to gain control of some something by paying, making a payment for it. It might be rightfully yours, but you now pay for it so that it becomes yours again. And that's what we've celebrated at communion. Christ was divorced from us through our sin. Christ went to the cross for us, putting our sin on him so that we could have fellowship with us. He's bought us again. We were time in eternity, formed to be perfect. And now we were removed from being able to relate to him because of our sin. And now he's taken that sin upon himself and said, I justify you by taking your sin. And that means that I can have fellowship with you. And we are enabled to see that through the Holy Spirit. Paul continues in chapter 1, he says, that you may give... That, may, that you might have the spirit of wisdom, of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, the immeasurable greatness of his power, according to the work of his great might. In the light of Christ's redemptive work and the Holy Spirit's enlightening, we know him through wisdom and revelation. We have a living hope. God loves us. Christ in humility died for us. The Holy Spirit seals us for eternity. So we have an eternal inheritance and a living hope. And Paul goes on in chapter 2 and spells that out again for us. He says that while we were spiritually dead, slaves to our desires, disobedient, unable and unwilling to change our behavior, separated from fellowship from God. Even in that state, Christ came, who is rich and merciful in his great love and in his grace for us, made us alive in Christ, raised us, made us his workmanship, prepared our path for good good conduct that we might walk in the ways that he has purposed for us. And so how do we respond? Well, let me first indicate to you how Paul responded. He's writing doctrine, he's writing teaching, and he now is so taken up with what he's writing, what he is convinced of, that he says to his readers, that you may be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth and the length, the height and the width, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. So after three chapters, that is Paul's desire for us. And he's so taken up with what he is, the message that he is conveying to them is conveying to his own heart. And so he bursts out into a doxology because he finishes chapter 3 with the following. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end of chapter 3. He's so consumed, so taken up with what he, as he writes and recalls and reminds himself of what Christ has done for him, that he bursts out in praise. And what about us? How are we to uh, acquire these clothes? Are we to respond as he does? Well, in adoration, in humble obedience, in a desire to please him, we plead, we can plead, that we be dressed in true righteousness and holiness. Let me give you a beautiful picture from Zechariah. Zechariah shows the high priest at that time who happened to be called Joshua, not the Joshua that we normally think of. And this high priest wasn't exactly perfect. And he is standing there, and on his right-hand side is Satan himself, Satan the arch-thief. And Satan is all set to condemn the high priest. And then standing in front of the high priest is a group of angels. And then behind the group of angels is the angel of the Lord, Christ. That's the picture that Zechariah conveys to us. And this is what we then read. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments, And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure garments, pure vestments. In other words, the angel of the Lord, between him and the high priest, are the angels and he instructs the angels to take off the dirty gar- garments so that the lord can come and in, clothe him in pure vestments now christ has gone one step further than that for us because he has taken the filthy garments and put them on himself and then he has clothed he invites us to be clothed in his righteousness and holiness And we are to be arrayed in him. Isaiah had the same feel expression. He was conscious that it was the Lord that dressed him. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So our spiritual clothing our, in, indicates our standing before our God. We, in a definitive action of our will, our heart and our soul and our mind, plead with him that we be dressed in his righteousness. And as I come to an end, what are the effects? Well, we can think of those, of what is the effect of wearing his garments? We can think of the words that Paul uses here, that we accomplish the good works which he has prepared beforehand that that we should walk in them. That's in chapter 3. But we've been talking about metaphors today, so let me think, let me introduce you to another metaphor. Paul says elsewhere when he's writing to um, the, in Timothy, um, he says, What we are to do is to adorn the doctrine. And he says the same thing here. We are to be his fragrance in this world. We can't 
do better than Christ, but we can display Christ. Our clothes should be, our vestments should be something that reflects the glory of Christ. And in doing that, our conduct and our character and our behavior will be ones that will uh, glorify him. So weak as we are, day by day, weakly framed, we are to ask the Lord to clothe us. In humility we come before him. Now it's the time of the year when all our New Year promises, or many of our New Year promises may be coming to an end. Let me suggest to you one promise that I challenge you to make. It's written by a 16th century Welshman. Don't be surprised by that. And in two sentences, he says the following. Here is something that you too can follow. When I awake at break of day, the cross of Christ be my array. That's our prayer daily, that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the cross of Christ be my array. You see, When we are wearing spiritual clothing, we are not fashion conscious, but we are conscious, we are Christ conscious. Our clothes don't reflect our character, but we are to reflect Him and His character. Our clothes are not to conform with the transient fashions of this world, but are to show that we are transformed for for eternity to be like Him. So, as I invite now our worship team to come forward, and we will then join with them to sing. And the words that we will sing are the following, and reflect upon them as you sing them. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing down. From hands and feet that were nailed to the tree, as grace flows down, and covers me.